Okay, hi everyone. I just want to give you an introduction to course design. So we'll go ahead and talk about some different frameworks that we'll be um, exploring throughout the semester. Um, as you know, we're going to start off by looking at the coverage-based design, which is really an approach that focuses more on um, content kind of driving the way that you set up your course. And then we'll be shifting into Wiggins and McTie's backward design, which you'll um, discover is a much more effective approach. It's much more thoughtful and comprehensive. And we will be using that approach in combination, really, with Bloom and Fink's approach. So Bloom and Fink both talk about I'm sorry, learning outcomes, and what we're going to do is just kind of explore their models and frameworks for that and how it can fit into the course design framework um, of Wiggins and Matai, their backwards design. So let's start off by looking at coverage-based design. The truth of the matter is, is that this is how most of us would approach teaching for the first time. You ask, what, what am I covering? What's the content? You know, many uh, faculty might even rely pretty heavily on the textbook. And, you know, without much other guidance, they might have some learning outcomes attached to the textbook. But pretty much where faculty are using this approach start is, what content do my students need to know? And that's not a bad question to ask, but it, when it drives the rest of the design, you're going to see throughout the semester how that really then significantly shapes, you know, le the learning process and, and how you teach. So what we want to do is we'll explore kind of the pros and cons of these different approaches as you, um, you know, look more deeply into the, the literature on them. So after you look at the content, um, you know, at that point, then you might decide what outcomes you want. And what you'll see is that many of the outcomes based on this approach are very content driven. So you'll see things like um, students will be able to know these types of theories or this kind of how to do this mathematical problem. It's going to all be very content driven when you use the content at the beginning place. The next part is as you look at your teaching methods. And as you saw in the Wiggins and Matai book, they talked a little bit about how even activity based coverage also can be problematic. Like, oh, I have this great activity to do, and it really may, may or may not fit into your overall goals, but you're looking at what kinds of methods can I use to teach the content. So content is often, you know, you have so much of it to do, it can be overwhelming both to you as the faculty member and also the student. So what the primary teaching method often is when you're using this approach is the lecture. So many faculty will rely fairly heavily on the lecture. And as you'll discover as we move through the semester, I am not um, someone who believes that lectures are, are bad. I actually think that lectures can be quite effective, and there's evidence out there that supports this line of thinking. But what happens is, is when you use a content-based content approach, the lecture can kind of be the primary method. So it's probably lecture and readings. You might integrate some group work or some other activities. You know, there might be a cool activity that you're doing to help them see the, um, get the content. So for ha perhaps you have a simulation exercise or something that really illustrates one of the um, concepts in your class, and that might work. So again, the focus pr starts off with the content then it shifts into the outcomes, but then it quickly moves into the activity. So what am I going to do in my class? So it really is um, very much driven, again, by um, the nature of what you have to cover. Then the last thing that you'll think about in this uh, design approach is how will I know whether or not I've achieved what I had set out to achieve? Do students know the content that I wanted them to learn at the beginning of the semester? And again, because it's so content-driven, exams tend to be one of the most widely used techniques. So you'll see that really the coverage-based design is very much based on teaching. What am I going to do as the faculty member? The focus is not so much on what is the student going to do. I mean, they do have assignments and exams and things of that nature, but it really is much more heavily focused on this is the content they need, how am I going to teach that to them? And then, you know, the exams and assignments are um, kind of the last, last step in the process. So now let's take a look at um, backwards design, and this is the Wiggins and Matai approach, of course, and what they have said is that, you know, really the best way to approach course design is to look at the end. So what, what is it that you want to accomplish? Why are you spending these, you know, 15 weeks or so together? Is there, you know, what are your learning outcomes? It may be that you want them to know some content, but perhaps there's also other skills that they need to develop. So it's a much broader look at what the desired results are. 
And then what happens is that those learning outcomes become center stage. They are the primary focus, the, the core of, in terms of everything else you do. So you would never think about a cool activity just because. You would have to first think about your learning outcome. Um, and this is very challenging. I've worked with lots of faculty and even students doing presentations, and they want to go straight to their teaching method. Well, I'm going to do this in my class. And I'm like, stop. You don't do that when you're doing backwards design. First, we spend an enormous amount of time focused on what it is that we want our students to be able to do, think, or know at the end of the semester. Okay? Now, once you have a clear understanding of what your learning outcomes are, and many of you may be given those learning outcomes from your chairperson, they might be department um, provided rather than you getting to determine them yourself, and that's fine. You just need to have a clear picture of what they are. The next step in backwards design is still not teaching methods, so you can't go there yet, but instead we're looking for evidence. And it's not just evidence at the end of the semester, but also along the way. So Wiggins and Matai really focus on, on how will you know whether students are on the right path and whether or not they actually achieve the goal at the end of the term. So now when you look at that, it all opens up a lot more different opportunities. It may not just be the exam. It certainly might include an exam, but that might not be maybe even the primary assessment method. So it depends, again, on what your goals are. If your goal is a critical thinking goal, if your goal is a um, being able to work with others, you know, it depends on what your goal is, will really vary, um, you know, will really make the, the evidence vary a little bit. So the idea here is, is that the goals are the driving force. Learning outcomes really determine that. Second step is about evidence. What kind of evidence will I have to know that students are moving towards those goals? And then how, what evidence will I have to know that they've accomplished those goals? Not all the evidence even needs to be a graded assignment, although many of those, um, you know, certainly will be. You'll need to give a grade, so it'll have to be something that is graded. But the feedback and, uh, will be valuable to students to let them know whether or not they're on the right path. So you'll look at it in a really wide, comprehensive way. Again, it might be that an exam does that. It might be that a paper does that. It might be that a project does that. Um, I encourage you strongly, if you're already teaching, to let go and not try to take a syllabus that you've already created and turn it into a backwards design syllabus because that usually doesn't work. It usually kind of keeps you too focused on your learning activities. It really is better to kind of have a fresh start and really ask yourself, what, it is, that, what is it that I want and how will I know if I achieve that? Then the last step, this is kind of the, the end of the process, is really thinking about what teaching methods will best work. So again, it depends on what your goal is, what the teaching method will be. But for some of you, that still will be a lecture. You know, if you have a lot of, if it's a content goal and, you know, that's what they need, you might need to provide some direct instruction on that. If it's more of a critical thinking goal, it might need to have, you know, more of a significant learning experience, whether it's in class or out of class, that might might um, you know kind of be best suited for that goal so the idea is, is you're constantly looking at is this going to get me what I was hoping um, to have students accomplish by the end of the semester so as you can see backwards design is really based on learning so the primary difference really is, is are you focused on what you are doing or are you focused on what the students are achieving and in backwards design that's what you're focused on student achievement of learning what did the students learn and how did I help facilitate that it could be through lectures, it could be through group work, a variety of ways, but it's all carefully crafted and constructed based on what students are going to be able to learn by the end of the semester. So now we come into the, the two taxonomies that really kind of help us shape um, the goals because as I mentioned before, the most important part of course design is knowing what you want your students to achieve. So in order to do that, we have to really look at different taxonomies that exist. And Bloom is probably the most well-known taxonomy of educational objectives out there. And basically what Bloom wanted to do was help us better understand what is it that we mean by, you know, having students know something. Aren't there different levels of knowing? Um, what evidence or what level are we looking for? So if you're teaching an introductory lower level class, you might be more focused on the lower levels of Bloom. Maybe remembering is your goal. I mean, in an elementary school, or even a middle school, or perhaps even a high school or very, um, you know, low level introductory class in college, remembering might be part of what you want them to do. Maybe they don't have any exposure to your content area and you need to build their foundational knowledge. So it is a good goal to have remembering, but in the college arena, we certainly don't want to stop there. That's a beginning point. 
that we may have one goal, but we're going to want to certainly work up our way, work our way up this pyramid and help our students engage in higher level thinking. So you can see the next level is understanding, um, you know, which kind of taps into comprehension of what they know. So it's not just pure memorizing, but are they comprehending it? And then can they apply it? Do they, are they able to take it and put it into practice? So for instance, perhaps, um, you know, you're teaching future teachers and you're teaching them lesson plans. So it's not just about to know what a lesson plan is, but can they actually, you know, apply that to evaluate and create different kinds of products. So as you think about the more cognitively complex concepts such as analyzing and evaluating, you know, ultimately the, the top tier is creating. So can you create an academic product that really illustrates so you know a lot about that subject matter? So it might be that you're creating um, a lesson plan, it might be that you're creating, um, you know, some kind of presentation or a paper, something that really illustrates that you have a high knowledge base. So again, the more you think about what level of knowing you want, the easier it will be to determine what evidence you'll need and then what teaching methods will help you get there. So you'll definitely want to keep Bloom in mind as we work through this class. And the last model that we'll be talking quite a bit about is Fink's Taxonomy of Significant Learning, and his is called the Integrated Course Design Model. And you'll see Fink's model is very different than Bloom's because it's not hierarchical, um, you know, so Bloom really thinks that they're stepping stones. Let me just go back a second. He thinks like you need to remember before you can understand, before you can apply, and so on and so forth. But with Fink, he doesn't really believe that so much. His philosophy is, is that we need to treat this kind of a, from a more global, holistic approach. And you'll see here that about half of uh, Fink's concepts align somewhat with Bloom's. You know, the right-hand side of this circle really tap into content knowledge. So he does have foundational knowledge, which would be the remembering and understanding level of Bloom's, right? So he does think that you need to have that. He also has application there, so that's moving up that Bloom taxonomy a little bit. So will um, students be able to take that information, think about it in different ways, and maybe apply it to different products or projects? He also has this other part that's called integration, and you can see here it's about connecting ideas and people and different parts of life. So it's, it's starting to see the connection so it's not isolated. So the idea here is, is that in order for students to really have a significant learning experience, it can't be kind of in this compartmentalized box. You need to make sure that this content connects to something else. And how does that connect? And to start to see that integration and, you know, kind of the relationships between concepts. On the left-hand side, you'll see that there's several different um, areas, you know, such as learning how to learn, caring, and the human dimension. And this is really where Fink talks, um, you know, quite a bit about how important it is that in order for it to be significant, it has to be meaningful. So you're going to learn more about yourself as a learner so that you can continue to grow and learn more about this content. You're also going to, you know, have... Um, you know, a little bit more idea about how this impacts you and others, you know, so what is the impact on me personally of having this information? Um, this is the human dimension that I'm talking about right now. And how does knowing about this help others also? You know, what difference does this content make? So you're kind of talking about the value of it. And then finally, that caring component, you know, that's really where you care and you're excited and you're passionate about something. And the more passionate you are and the more you care about a content, that really makes it a much more significant experience for you. So Fink really believes that all these elements are really essential. And again, he, he buys into the backwards design philosophy. He just wants to make sure that when you're doing that first component, the um, you know, learning outcomes, that you're not being too narrow and content focused and you're really looking at it from a broad, more holistic way. All right, so that's it. Um, hopefully that gave you a brief introduction. Clearly I can't give you as much detail as the text is giving you, but um, I hope that provides you at least with a little bit of help and support. And, you know, of course you can always reach out with questions as we move along.